about the uh, joint development or joint exploration mm -hmm. in the Calamian group of islands. There is a part in West Calamian group of islands that's actually out uh, inside the uh, inside the nine dash line, but outside the Philippine EDC. Mm -hmm. That could be subjected to a joint exploration, and they can, you know, we can call it in our domestic law, we can call it a service contract agreement. Mm -hmm. In their law, they can call it joint exploration, joint development. Does not violate the Philippine Constitution because it's outside. Mm -hmm. uh, it's outside the Philippine EEZ. But at the same time, it's also inside the nine dash line. So maybe the, they should have started from there. And then moving inside of the nine dash line and inside, uh, I mean, still inside the nine dash line and inside the Philippine EEZ, that could still be uh, explored through the joint, uh, through the uh, service contract arrangement mm -hmm. that Philippine law provides. And that remains to be seen if China is actually willing to go that far and uh, uh, as you uh, told me before that there is already an MOU um, and that MOU is uh, uh, expecting China to adhere to Philippine law yes. through a service contract yes, arrangement. That's, that's the new the subject of discussions here because by November next month Manila and Beijing are supposed to conclude uh, to, to finalize this MOU. And, you know, what's stirring discussion here is that will China agree to a service contract which implicitly, implicitly in which they will recognize Philippine sovereignty over Reed Bank. Uh, but you have studied uh, security issues. Do you think China will agree to this? And why did they sign an MOU with a with the service contract arrangement, although that's still in the initial phase? I think China is buying time. I'm not, I'm quite pessimistic of the agreement that China would actually agree to a, uh, uh, an arrangement that implicitly recognizes the Philippine sovereign rights over, uh, I think you're talking about SC-57? Yes, Wait. that's the Reed, Reed Bank. It covers oh, the Recto Bank. Yeah, I don't right. have the exact SC number, but that's just specific to Recto Bank. So For, that's, that's the subject. I'm very pessimistic about mm -hmm. uh, uh, that, and I don't think China would eventually agree to uh, um, implicitly recognize Philippine sovereign rights by agreeing to a, a, a service contract arrangement. Um, again, however, it gives, I want to be wrong on this, this is a big opportunity for China to prove to the world that, hey, if you're friendly with us, we're actually willing to compromise. We're actually mm -hmm. willing to, you know, probably adhere to the rule of law without appearing weak. Mm -hmm. um, for now, I can't see that happening. Yeah, but that's what you just said is the thinking of some of our Filipino diplomats. They're, ho they're saying that apparently there's pressure on China to be friendly to the Southeast Asian nations. And as you said, this is one way of compromising. However, with what's happening in Vanguard Bank in Vietnam, uh, I, I can't, uh, why are they harassing uh, Vietnamese and uh, uh, Russian uh, groups exploring for oil and energy, and yet we, they will agree to a service contract here in the Philippines? Or what is the impact of what's happening in Vietnam now? To I Manila? think Vietnam has realized that uh, China is China's tolerance of their existing activities in their uh, EEC that's inside the nine dash mm -hmm. lines um, is already uh, growing thin. And I think uh, the Vietnamese at some point in the future will consider filing an Annex 7 uh, case against mm -hmm. China. Um, as a first step, however, I see the Vietnamese using the threat of a third party adjudication as a leverage to uh, mm -hmm. Uh, compel the Chinese to withdraw. Um, if the Chinese does not withdraw, at some point, I think the Vietnamese will uh, file a case and limit mm. it to Vanguard Bank specifically. That's interesting. So you think um, there is, I understand there is a debate going on in the Vietnamese Communist Party whether to file a case or not to file a case. One school of thought says it's futile. Mm. It's useless because China won't uh, anyway accept the ruling. Uh, but you said they may do this if 
if it comes to a point that China um, insists on staying there in, in their EEZ? Yeah, um, but I think the Vietnamese also recognize the value of a legal judgment. Right now, it's uh, when it comes to the Vanguard Bank, it's China's words against Vietnam's words. Uh, the Chinese has been saying the Chinese have been saying that their activities in the Vanguard Bank is in, a, is in accordance with international law and in accordance with quote historical facts. Those words are backed by China's uh, ability to use force to coerce. Mm. On the other hand, Vietnam's words is only backed by you know their words. There is no definitive legal uh, judgment on the matter, and if. Vietnam could get that legal backing by going to court. That's going to take three, four years. But, you know, that's going to allow them to uh, push back against the Chinese narrative mm -hmm. and give them uh, the leverage to maybe at some point in the future ask the Chinese for a compromise. So they, but, can, uh, yeah. Yeah. So they can learn from, from the Philippines in this case. If, if they're going to file a similar arbitration case using Annex 57, right? So they can learn. Annex seven. Uh, yeah, they can learn from the Philippines. Yes, they can certainly learn from the <laughs> Philippines, um, but not learn from President Duterte's <laughs> approach. Because I think if they're going to leverage a win, uh, they can certainly do a lot of. Uh, 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 you know, they can probably convince the Chinese to think twice before moving ahead and keep uh, pushing the envelope on the South China Sea issue. Uh, you were, we talked earlier about your assessment of Duterte's three-year embrace of China. So you said, um, do you think this policy has become, instead of a boost to stability in the South China Sea, has become a threat because Chinese presence has escalated in the West Philippine Sea? Uh, you know, swarming of ships, militia, coast guard uh, around Pag-asa, you know, several incidents already. So is it extreme to call it a threat? Certainly it's a threat to the Philippines' long-term national interest. Mm -hmm. For now, I think the president has his own red line. I don't know what that red line is, but I think he has his own red line. And for as long as China does not cross that, he is still willing to entertain the idea of China at some point maybe compromising and maybe, you know, um, agreeing to some sort of an arrangement with the Philippines. However, he has a ceiling. So he can't continue to accommodate the policy preferences of the Chinese. Um, there are domestic pressures. And uh, the Philippine constitution itself is also limiting his ability to accommodate the preferences of the Chinese, especially in matters related to uh, joint development or joint exploration. Mm -hmm. um, he can only do so far. Uh, he can't. He can't fully embrace China's policy preferences of, you know, joint development and uh, mm -hmm. uh, ignoring the activities of China that have been disrupting the status quo. Mm -hmm. Uh, you mentioned about the red line. Actually, Duterte has not explicitly said this, but it was his former foreign secretary, Cayetano, who said that the red line, their red line is Scarborough Shoal. The Chinese, right. even, if they're, even if they're in control, should not build anything on Scarborough Shoal. Uh, what are your thoughts on this? Uh, isn't Scarborough Shoal strategic to Chinese interests in South China Sea? It is very strategic, and that's why I can't understand why Filipino officials have resigned to the idea that it's already under China's control. Is it really under China's control? Um, if we say so, and if we agree with that, then it's in China's control. But as I think we are still there. Our fishermen are still there. Um, they are fishing. Uh, the status quo is actually what the ruling in 2016 has said, which is that it's a shared fishing ground. Right, the ruling in 2016 said that the Scarborough Shoal is a shared fishing ground uh, between and among the Chinese, the Vietnamese, and the Filipinos. And our fishermen continue to fish there. And so I think we should not, uh, we should dispel the idea that China has complete control over the Scarborough Shoal. Having said that, I think uh, indeed that is the red line of of the president mm -hmm. that it's uh, not going to be acceptable uh, for China to build structures there. Um, and it, 
if China builds structures there, uh, I think the president should seriously consider looking at the alliance options or looking at maybe operationalizing some of the provisions of the uh, 1951 MDT. Uh, going back to the arbitral ruling which you mentioned, it's interesting that in August when the president went to Beijing, he raised it with President Xi Jinping, uh, and of course it was rejected. Um, do you think this was um, something Duterte had to do because of public pressure from the Philippines? And what did this achieve? Just you know, mentioning it to Xi Jinping, what did this achieve for our relations with China? Well, at first I was uh, positive about it until mm -hmm. I read the news that he was apologetic while mentioning the arbitral award. And so I think he did it half-heartedly only to satisfy his promise that he would do so at some point in his term. And he did that uh, not really strongly or firmly. He did not emphasize the primacy of international law. He did not, uh, I don't know how hard he pushed for Philippine national interest, but the, your reports on Rappler said that he was uh, uh, apologetic while raising the issue. So I think that's uh, that's uh, not very good for the Philippine interest to to just you yeah. know apologetically uh, apologetically raise the uh, issue and then forget it. The, here's the one school of thought is that okay he raised the issue it was rejected he raised the ruling it was rejected then why can't the Philippine government take other diplomatic steps? For example, the president even crowdsourced ideas. He said, can you give me, you know, what is the formula? And, you know, there are so many ideas from Justice Carpio, for former Foreign Secretary Del Rosario, let's bring it to the UN, let's have sea boundary agreements, etc. But none of this has been um, taken up by government. So uh, you think that uh, these options are no longer on the table? I mean, Those options are still on the table. It's just that I go back to my first point. Um, I think the president has no strategy. I think he has not really thought out of all the possible options that uh, the Philippines could take. Um, he and I would argue that he is not listening to experts. Um, there are options that he could take, and he has so far not. Uh, taken those. And if you look at the options being given to him, those are given to him by uh, sort of political opposition. The, uh, probably those people that he would consider as uh, 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 not friendly yeah, to his yeah. policies, yeah, yeah, critical yeah. to yeah. his policies. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't think Alan Cayetano or uh, other people in his uh, cabinet um, have given him sound advice. Uh, only Lorenzana, I can see Lorenzana as being, uh, you know, sincere enough to actually uh, push for the Philippine interest. And unfortunately, the past three years, if you try to really analyze the rhetoric coming from the president, it seems that his parochial concern has become the country's national interest. It's, it's, it's no longer like, what is it for the Philippines? It's like, what is it for him and his narrow concerns? Um, how about yeah. like just that? How about uh, you've been uh, watching also, or listening to the rhetoric or reading the rhetoric of our foreign secretary, Chodoro Loxin? And he, you know, in a speech he gave in Washington D.C. before the Asia Society, he was critical of China. Uh, so, what do you think? You know, he sometimes he says views different from those of the president. Sometimes. <laughs> so that's what's wrong with, I think that's what's wrong with the Philippine uh, Foreign Department of Foreign Affairs. A lot of uh, contradictory statements. So today he's saying something that is music to the ears of Xi Jinping. Tomorrow he will say something that's probably contrary to the uh, policy preferences of the Chinese. So which is which? And I think if we are going to continue that path of trying to give mixed messages, uh, the trust of other countries towards the Philippines yeah. will certainly be diminished. Um, we have not been consistent. Uh, we don't. Our foreign policy is no longer as principled as it should be. 
we are, in fact, you know, if you look at the rhetoric from the Vietnamese foreign ministry, very consistent, always mentioning, mentioning adherence to international law, including the 1982 UN Convention on the Law of the Sea. We have not been consistent in our messaging. Uh, if you look at the Shangri-La Dialogue, is annually uh, yeah. being held in Singapore every June. And if you look at the uh, statements of Vietnamese officials from 2002 up to the present, there has never been a time when they did not mention UNFOS. Mm. So they have been consistent. So although they have not filed a case yet, they have been consistent and clear-eyed on the value of international law for countries like themselves facing uh, facing a giant. That's, uh, that's really interesting you mentioned that because during the recent National Day of Vietnam, which was celebrated here in a hotel in Manila, and which I attended, the Vietnamese ambassador gave a speech, and then, you know, uh, strongly, uh, he mentioned again UNCLOS, and uh, without mentioning China, but talked about the rule of law and UNCLOS, and uh, but it was obvious it was China. So, in that sense, they're consistent. Now, why can Vietnam be consistent, be strong? Uh, unlike the Philippines, but we have one thing in common. China is the biggest trading partner of Vietnam, same as in the Philippines. So why can't they do it and why can't we? Well, we change leaders uh, every six years. So our foreign policy changes every six years. Um, but that is still very peculiar because we are a democratic country. We have a mutual defense treaty with the United States and we should be harping the same thing over and over again. And that is the primacy of international law in the uh, in our pursuit of foreign policy. And so far, I just, I don't know why we have not been sticking to the same rhetoric. Uh, and instead, we uh, somehow uh, entertain the idea of being transactional with the Chinese. It's okay, I, I don't think it's they're mutually exclusive. Pursuit of the rule of law is not necessarily uh, uh, mutually exclusive with uh, finding a common ground with the Chinese, a friendly relations with the Chinese. Um, mm -hmm. I don't know what else to say. Yeah, okay. Now let's go to another subject that's related. Uh, there has been uh, some uh, public reaction toward the plan of the third telco company in the Philippines called Dito Telecommunity, which is a yeah. part partner with China telecom mm. the plan is to there was an agreement already between the military and Dito telecommunity to build cell phone facilities within military camps and installations of course you know there was a Senate inquiry on this and uh, what is your take isn't this a security concern um, for the Philippines uh, should should the Philippines proceed with China Telecom and, and Dito Telecom Unity to build uh, facilities within military camps? It is a security concern. Um, I don't know if you're aware of the app that's called uh, Xi Jinping Thought. It's an app <laughs> on smartphones. It's supposed to uh, you know, educate <laughs> the people of the world about you know, the thinking of policy priorities or preferences of uh, mm -hmm. President Xi Jinping. And uh, I think a German IT firm recently discovered that that app provides a backdoor uh, entry. And the only thing that you can do if you have already uploaded that app is to factory reset your phone. Otherwise, uh, you will be spied on. Mm. And even if you delete the app, you have to factory reset it. So that just an app. How much more if it's a, a uh, cell site? An installation inside military camps. And here's the thing, uh, I'm surprised that the military was able to complete that deal without Lorenzaren knowing it. Yeah, Lorenzaren, I think yeah. their news outlet uh, has reported about the fact that Lorenzana was completely unaware. How can, how can a defense secretary be unaware of uh, this kind of deal when it's very important? I, I think that was the same question asked during the Senate inquiry. And it appears to the military that it's a routine agreement because they have similar agreements with Smart and with Globe. But these are Philippine companies. Smart has a partner, though. It's, I think, a Japanese company. 
and Globe has a partner, a Singaporean company. So yeah. obviously we don't have they don't have claims over South China Sea, you know. So but still they went ahead. Uh, it's now for under review by Lorenzana, and we haven't heard from him yet. Uh, but that app about you talked about is uh, something we should be uh, we should not download because you said otherwise would be spied on. But another basic thing I think here is that Chinese civilians are required. Are you is this correct? To, are required to provide information to the Chinese government? Uh, yes. If they are asked, Many right? Corporate. Again? Yeah, they are required. But under Chinese law, Chinese companies are required uh, to supply information to the Chinese Communist Party if uh, requested. Mm -hmm. So this in the uh, Defense Secretary Lorenzana mentioned, or someone mentioned during the Senate inquiry, that anyway, these other two companies, Smart and Globe, are using Huawei. So what's the difference? So what's the difference between Dito telecommunity building within military camps and the other two companies using Huawei? They're using Huawei hardwares. Hardwares? I, I think so. Yeah. Right? Yes. So yes. I, I, I think there is a big difference. Now you have a Filipino company partnering with a state-owned enterprise. China Telecom is a state-owned enterprise, 100% mm -hmm. owned by the Chinese government. So I think there's a big difference. Mm -hmm. So, um, of course, we're all waiting for Defense Secretary Lorenzana's uh, word on whether it's going to push through or not. Maybe one final question, uh, Jeff, is that Duterte visited Russia recently and he invited Rosneft, a uh, Russian energy company, to explore mm. for oil and gas in the West Philippines. It's very broad. We don't know yet the details. This may take some time. But what's your reading of that uh, invitation? I don't think that's part of a wider strategy, but I think that is a good uh, uh, approach. Indeed, we should be diversifying. Uh, mm. Russia is a, has a good experience on, joint, uh, on expo exploring uh, uh, maritime zones, and it has partnership with uh, Vietnamese oil companies. I think that's a step in the right direction, but whether the Russians uh, uh, could afford to offend the Chinese is another matter. I don't. Mm. I'm kind of pessimistic about that. I don't think they're gonna uh, risk uh, uh, financial investments uh, in the South China Sea, considering that the uh, uh, situation there is volatile. And you know, anytime mm. China can uh, use whatever levers it has against the Philippines to coerce it. Um, and that's another thing. Uh, we, the Duterte administration is still bent on really deepening our economic dependence on the Chinese. Um, I think doing that is like giving the Chinese more levers through which to coerce us in the future. Mm -hmm. um, instead of diversifying, which is you know the hallmark of an independent foreign policy, is to diversify it, um, partnership, uh, you know, diversify it, economic partners, diversify trading partners, and whatnot. But I think. Uh, uh, he has not been doing that, and uh, that's uh, a danger to the long-term national interest of the country. Thank you very much, Jeff. Uh, uh, you really mentioned uh, vital issues here about the lack of strategy, although it seems like it's intuitive <laughs> for uh, our president, and also the threat to our long-term national interest. You know, I think there should be some... Uh, rethinking going on among us in the public, even think tanks here in the Philippines. So thank you, Jeff, and we hope to keep in touch. And to our uh, listeners and viewers, thank you for taking time to listen to our interview. We, we will keep uh, discussing the issue of Philippine-China relations in future interviews. Thank you. Thank you.